Anis Sethi, who is an Ahmedabad-based uh, interdisciplinary practitioner with her primary concern lying between memory, body, culture, and space. Um, she also conceptualized and designed Conflictorium, uh, which is a participatory and interactive museum that is based out of Me Ahmedabad, and that explores the concept of conflict. And she has studied interdisciplinary design from Sh Shrishti School of Design, um, uh, Art, Design, and Technology, Bangalore, and she has also pursued her master's in performance studies at Ambedkar University. Her primary area of interest lies in exploring the relationship between um, intimate audience and the performing body. Today, as part of Agas, uh, and the fact that the theme of the fest, uh, the theme of the fest is art as resistance, she's going to talk about uh, love at sight of uh, contested narratives. So I invite uh, Avni Ma'am on stage to begin the talk, and please give a round of applause for her. Hi, everybody. It's uh, always the best to be speaking at student-organized festivals. There's nothing nicer than that. So thank you for having me over. Um, it's also nice to be back in Bangalore for business. Uh, I studied here and haven't really been back since. So mm, what I've also realized is that none of Bangalore is familiar to me anymore. Um, Generally, I start talking to, to groups about the conflictorium because that has taken over my, my life as my primary identity. Um, but I think I'm going to start somewhere else today and arrive at the conflictorium eventually. Um, And I don't know whether this helps, but I'm going to be speaking, or maybe you should be listening to me, keeping in mind that I live and make work in Gujarat, whatever that means. <laughs> um, we are a special kind of a case and the consequence of which I think the country is suffering at the moment. Um, and in a situation like that, what does the role of the artist become? Um, it's an unending curiosity for me and my practice to say uh, how much space do I occupy, how much silence do I offer as an artist, um, and how does one imagine our times? What is the articulation of our times? Um, I was trained uh, as a dancer. I started training when I was seven. Um, do you want to do away with some of these lights so that the images are clearer. Yeah, maybe better. Thank you. Um, I trained in Kathak at the age of seven, and I always say this, that there is no grand plan or no child knows what uh, dance form they want to study. It's either the parents who decide because they've liked some actress, somebody else who danced really well, or the child has too much energy, has to be sent out of the house. Whatever dance class is the closest to home, she will be sent there. So um, Kathak class was closest to my home, and so I studied Kathak. Um, but while the idiom, like most classical idioms, are are um, imagining the human body not as human, is imagining dance not as, as in this moment, not contemporary, but is sort of carrying the burden of centuries and then the heavens and then the lords and all of these kinds of things. So was my training. Um, but somewhere down the line, I discovered um, what today we call, in a comprehensive way, we say mystic poetry. So I discovered Bullesha, for myself, um, who's a Punjabi Sufi poet, um, and Kusru. 
Um, and they came to my rescue as a dancer because suddenly there was meaning. Uh, I was making sense of why I was dancing. Um, and one way of imagining, uh, one way of imagining their poetry is uh, to think of lover and the beloved. Um, but another way of thinking of their poetry is also that they were being very, very political for the time that they wrote all this poetry in. Um, and what did, therefore, their politics mean, or continues to mean to me as a dancer? Um, Okay, let's try this. All right. um, I want to tell you a little story um, based in Ahmedabad. So what you're seeing here right now is the Musa Suhag Darga in Ahmedabad. Musa Suhag um, was a saint. If if I talk a little bit in Urdu Hindi, w will there be a problem? Will someone any problem? No, little bit, only bits. If you don't understand, I'll I'll be happy to translate. Uh, um, and um, Musa Zuhag, they say, fell in love with Nizamuddin, and um, they went from Junjunu to Delhi, and in an encounter. The legend says it was acknowledged, and Musa Suhag was told that you go and make your in Ahmedabad. Go and set up your life in Ahmedabad. And Musa Suhag went to Ahmedabad. He had no friends, nobody they knew, nobody, um, nobody who belonged to the same silsila. Um, and Musa Suhag, while, while, while going to Delhi from Junjunu, had seen the Suhagans. Uh, this is a trope that is repeated in a lot of mystic poetry. So they saw the Suhagans and said, Ye to main apne, um, ke liye, bhi dalne kapde. So Musa Suhag dressed as a Suhagan. Chudi, sari. And with the Chudi, sari, went to Ahmedabad, set up life. Um, but nobody would take them in except a group of trans people who were singing and dancing and were dressed similarly. And so there was identification and Musa Suhag asked whether I can, I can join you and they said, yes, you can, provided that you will sing and dance with us. And Musa Suhag agreed. And, um, and lived with them. Now, the thing with Musa Suhag was people used to consider mm, Musa as madzub, as someone who was mad. And madness, on one hand, is allowed or has many affordances. Um, in madness, you are allowed to transgress. Um, so, Musa Suhag wore the churi sari, did namaz, uh, went into the mosque, but somehow the affordances were there. Now, because there was, it said that jiski nazre karam, Nizamuddin ki nazre karam jis pe patti hai, wo fir peer ho jate If you've heard Chhap Tilak, which is a popular song, right? It's talking about um, seeing, sight. Um, so Musa Suhag was a peer, but in secret. Nobody knows this. Nobody knew this then. Um, and once there was a drought in Ahmedabad. And at that point of time, uh, the patron saint of Ahmedabad was Shah Alam. Uh, Shah Alam became popular in in more recent times because the largest camp post the 2002 Gujarat riots was at Shah Alam. Um, and Shah Alam said, no, no, don't come to, to me to make this dua for the rain. 
गो टू दिस मैड पर्सन और गो टू दिस मजूब वो पीर हैं लेट मूसा सुहाग मेक दिस दुआ एंड दे वेंट टू मूसा सुहाग हिज हिज सीक्रेट हैड बिन रिवील्ड मूसा सुहाग वॉज अ पीर दे मेड द दुआ एंड इट रेन्ड बट एवर सिंस देन दिस दरगाह विच इज नॉट अ पॉपुलर दरगाह अमंग्स Ahmedabad at large, but is very frequently visited by the trans population of Ahmedabad. It's also visited very often um, when it's not raining. Um, now this story is nowhere in writing. We had to piece it together. We had to sit with the Khadim in Musa Suhag's Darga. We had to go to Nizamuddin Aulia's Darbar and ask the ask the Khadim there and the Gaddi Nasheen, "Kya apne kabi suna tha Musa Suhag ke baare mein, etc., etc." And this is an approximation of what could have transpired. Um, with me is Askari Nakhvi, uh, who sings Soz Khwani. Uh, Soz is what is performed during Muharram, which is soon coming. um it's a retelling of the battle of karbala so askari and i spent a lot of time at the dargah and in the nizamuddin dargah and pieced this oral history together somehow now how does one share it um how does one share a story like this where the m- many possibilities of how this story was never told this story was never told to us as a story of a trans person um this story was never told to us uh, as a person who was uh, reimagining faith one of the things that i didn't speak about but how did musa suhag make the dua um they raised their hands um and said if you don't send down the rains i'll pick up this brick and break my bangles and i will be your widow forever now how many transgressions have happened in that one dua um musa suhag has afforded mortality to the lord right for the first time we've never heard of something like that um is making a deal as also as 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 also imagine gender in some form um But when we were told this story it was never told in these ways um i'm going to just give you snippets of some of these works and then and then try and make sense of all of them together uh after having danced and not wanting to dance and not seeing how any of this is making sense because how long how long can i talk about krishna uh so i did go through a period of not dancing at all um and uh, it's only it's only when one opened myself to being vulnerable to the kind of politics that that gujarat um was unfolding I'm going to give you dates. I was about 12 years old in 2002. Um and there is a very very vivid image from 2002 I have. Um we were all very used to listening to this phrase that there is a dhamal happening and that's why schools are shut 10:30 please go home. Now dhamal actually translate is translated is a word for fun. Right? Dhamal. Um so riots um uh, the euphemism for riots was dhamal now we were so used to this dhamal happening but the dhamal was always somewhere else it was never where we are it was always far away in shahpur or not here you're safe here you don't need to bother somewhere else but that changed in 2002 it changed because you could be wherever in the city um you could be whoever in the city you were either a survivor or not or a witness everybody 
in Ahmedabad was a witness. So you could be in very, very comfortable spaces in your homes, but you would have to see the fire outside your house because it was the landscape of that city was lined with smoke. So very little chances of, um, of you not being witness or you not being shahid. Um, and then there was very little chance to continue to dance like this, but somehow um, move towards uh, maybe what Musa Suhag understood best was madness, uh, was to be manzu. In 2017, in fact, August of 2017, um, there were graffitis that went up in Ahmedabad that said, uh, for those of you who can't read Gujarati, it says, Lav Jihati Savdhan. Um, that is just one of the many graffitis that went up across the city. Not one wall, not two walls, not in an area. This was a cross, whether you were in majority Ahmedabad or minority Ahmedabad. You saw it across. Um, in fact, this one says, Lav Jihati Savdan, but most others read, Hindu Dikario Lav Jihati Savdan. So it was a very, very specific. What does it mean? It means uh, Hindu daughters beware of Lav Jihad. Um, all of us saw it. Um, we drove past it. I drove past it for months. Uh, and uh, the question of the city and its how we imagine ownership of the city is such a is always a fraught kind of thing. No, how. Yeah, it's my city, but how much space can I occupy? How can I say? What can I say? Also, um, whoever is writing that, this one is signed by the Bajrangdal. So it says Bajrangdal there. Bajrangdal has way more men, uh, access to way more men, way more paint, and way more violence than I can possibly imagine to gather or like, put together. So clearly, this can't be about vandalism versus vandalism. That's not, that, that was not an option. Um, and so then what do I do? Um, and at that point of time, I think the only thing or the only skill that I had that I had faith in was my dancing. Um, and uh, so I took a little amplifier and played a song, popular song, called Jab Pyar Kiya To Darna Kiya from Mughal Azam. Um, which also occurs in the film at an interesting point in time. Um, at, at the point where there is a fearless declaration of love in front of the all-powerful emperor by uh, Naj Nevali. Um, and I danced at five different spots in the city. Now. What I had imagined was that this was going to be, hopefully, a conversation starter with the 30 or 40 people who will stop by. Uh, but some gentleman on the side took a, took a video, a phone video, and put it up online. The next morning when I woke up, there was whatever is the new phenomena, the web phenomena of a video going viral, and whatever comes with a video going viral. So there was, of course, a lot of support and a lot of appreciation for something like that, but there was also a lot of hate. Um, and I was, I was very interested in what was the other side of this story. Uh, and the other side of the story, in some, um, some RSS mouthpieces on the web um, had interesting headlines, which, which are the ones I have archived. Um, and they read that Ahmedabad dancers does not want awareness to protect young girls. So uh, 
So th th this, this was an opportunity to actually engage with the other side of the narrative also. Um, this photograph is actually right outside a college. So imagine your college and then the, the gate outside. It reads uh, the same thing. It reads Hindu Dikariyo Love Jihad Thi Savdan signed by Bajrangdal and on the left it says Jai Shri Ram. Um, this was this was clicked in uh, Pune. What we are seeing here is the FTII gate, the Film and Television Institute of India. Um, they have a budget where every year, twice a year, on the 26th of January and the 15th of August, a force structure is set up such that the students can learn patriotism. And so a four structure was set up such that people around the 15th of August can pay obeisance, uh, not realizing that this was a monument that was, or a memorial that was built in memory of soldiers who fought Indian, yes, but who fought for the British. Um, so, we, I thought it was a little absurd that we were doing this, and um, what are the kind of symbols that we have imagined as, as our objects of respect? Um, but we've done that always, and not only we, uh, the subcontinent has done that. That is a massive memorial um, in Sri Lanka, in Jaffna. Um, the memorial is uh, commemorating the victory of the Sri Lankan army. But the question to ask is, whose death is it commemorating? And so memorials, most often than not, when seen, um, the question that we should probably be asking, or at least I have begun asking, is that who is the memorial not built for? Um, were the Tamilian people in Sri Lanka not Sri Lankan? Only a question. They, they probably didn't, meaning that there are sides that may say, no, we were Tamil and we were fighting for a separate Tamil land. Were they, um, so can a memorial or must a memorial imagine uh, celebrating violence? In effect, that's what this is. Um, and who is left over? Who's left over from this violence? So there are Tamil men and Sinhalese men, um, and they are fighting this war, and there is a lot of violence, and where are the marks of this violence left over for who to witness? Um, who is the Shahid again? Um, it's the women. Uh, it's the women who witness. And then what happens to witnessing? What do you do with being witness? And I, I, I'm asking this uh, with a certain kind of gravitas, because you are in a time um, and I am in a time when, if nothing more, we are witnesses, for sure, if, if nothing else. Um, this is a piece called Vizina Zanana. It's a one-hour durational performance called Vizina Zanana, and this is a Zanana and the camera is sitting in a, in a place where the audience wouldn't, actually. Um, it's one hour of me cooking mutton curry and rice on the one hand. Um, and when you are cooking mutton curry and rice, you have to do a lot of waiting. You have to wait for the onions to brown. You have to wait for the mutton to cook. What do you do when you do all of these things? Um, 
On the other hand, I write love letters. Partly also because my, my being was informed so much by the food that my lovers fed me um, that it was only fair that I wrote love letters. Um, the hour is over, the mutton is cooked and I cook for 20, 30, 40 people. I offer vulnerability as a performer. Um, I am not writing a rehearsed letter. I am not writing a letter that is premeditated. I am being absolutely honest and offering a voyeuristic frame to my audience and say here, this is exactly what my domestic life and all my tensions of occupying this kind of domesticity that's fraught with wanting out um, but can't. Um, but as a performer, let me offer this frame to you. Um, when the hour is over, I leave and audiences enter the zanana. Read, eat, and leave. Now, the question to ask is, we are curious all the time. We want to do this all the time. Uh, but suddenly, when you do get to do it and you're, you're being watched as an audience by someone else, be voyeuristic, then the gaze has shifted. The gaze has shifted back to you. Um, so you are actually, as you are a spectator, you are also a performer simultaneously because you're being watched by the guy or the girl opposite, uh, seeing a very, very private moment. And uh, it's actually this, uh, this arrival of agreeing that, or rather accepting that as an artist, what I can offer is possibly vulnerability. And not only in performance, but, but in this moment when, say, I'm talking to you. I could speak to you in a way that was completely rehearsed, that I knew exactly what I was saying and I could come and deliver a lecture. I could do that. Um, but I can choose to reveal who I truly am in this moment. Um, as an artist, I feel that becomes my biggest responsibility or my biggest form of practice. Um, in an age where um, I am pushed to perform very, very, very public violences every day in the way I believe, in the way I talk, um, Going back to 2013, um, this was a house called Gul Lodge that belonged to a Parsi lady who was Ahmedabad city's first trained hairstylist. Um, she was Parsi, never married, never had heirs, and before she died, donated the building um, and said, I would like something good to happen to this building. This is what the building became a year later, um, and this is what is now the Conflictorium or the Museum of Conflict. Um, the museum imagines itself as some form of a platform where art practice could intersect with conflict transformation processes. Um, in Gujarat, when we were setting up the museum, one response in our primary research that we would get very, very often is why do you want to do a museum of conflict? Gujarat has no conflict. 
And oh, you're talking about 2002. 2002 is an aberration. But otherwise, we've been peaceful. I mean, Gujarat also has a hangover. We have a Gandhian hangover. So we just we we did, do not acknowledge that we are a fairly violent kind of people. Um, and so we started looking at 1960 to 2013, and now 2019. Um, and saying, really, let's, let's try and make a list of the kinds of conflict that Gujarat has seen. And you discover that 1960s, when the state of Gujarat is formed, it's separated from the Bombay presidency, and it's born out of a linguistic conflict. So the raison d'etre for Gujarat is a linguistic conflict, and many, many more. There's been caste violence. There's The irony is that they say that Gujarat is one of the safer states uh, for women on the street. But the irony is that it's one of the most dangerous places for women in their homes because the domestic violence rate is one of the highest in Gujarat. So we are continuously living in this kind of, these kind of schizophrenias. So on one hand, we do talk about development of a particular kind, and on the, on the other, whatever, whatever, um, whatever kinds of humanities must exist, don't. So it's a kind of strange, um, everything is about binaries. Uh, Those are just two of the exhibits at the Conflictorium. So the Conflictorium has two floors divided between permanent exhibits. And by permanent exhibits, I mean conceptually permanent exhibits. Um, and then you have the floor above that does temporary exhibits. So a lot of the ground floor deals with ideas such as empathy, or citizenship, or democracy. Or what do these ideas really mean in in 2019. And the upstairs are more topical. So for example, what you're seeing here, an image, is uh, a photograph from an exhibition called Blue Icon, uh, Contemporary Reiterations of Ambedkar. And this was curated by a photographer called Sudhara Kolve. The exhibitions, on one hand, could go the route of saying, we will do an exhibition on a thematic so-and-so. Um, or the other route to take is that this exhibition will be spoken. People will speak whose voices need to be heard. And so it'll never, uh, an exhibition will try very, very hard to not speak for, but to to make space and have, have people speak whose, whose voices have not been heard. Um, so for example, we did an exhibition called Imagining a Forest, which was dealing with tribal rights, the forest, what it means to be urban. Um, and the artists who are showing work is artists like Matai or artists like Raju Patel, who, are, who have lived as, meaning who who, who are tribal and have world views on everything. They have views on national policy, on education, on uh, material culture. And so it's unfair to say that um, you are a tribal artist and you operate only as a tribal artist in this exotic frame that we will offer you. Um, This is a photograph from something called the Sorry Tree, which exists at the museum. Now, apology, so basic, yet so political in Gujarat and now, I guess, in India. Um, it's a really simple exhibit. There are these little notes that are in two languages, um, empty on one side. And this comes somewhere at the end of the museum experiences where you are offered these notes and if you want 
you can write a note behind and tag it. Um, and some people write the most moving things about what they're sorry about. Very often, people are sorry to the self, um, but often they're sorry to other people. But once, a gentleman got very, very angry when they arrived at this balcony. And he said, why should I say sorry? I am not sorry. It was not my fault. They deserved it. All this conversation is happening only in rhetoric. And the person who was taking them around said, you don't have to say sorry. Optional. But these kind of experiences at the museum happen very, very often. Um, there are people who are feeling very, very emotionally charged about what they're experiencing. Maybe because the museum is continuously putting you in a spot to examine your own position. It rarely gives you answers because the museum has no answers. It certainly has no historical artifact that you can see. Um, but it has a bunch of installations or experiences um, that, that will push you to be reflexive about how you believe what you believe. Um, and it, 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 ends up, it ends up pushing you towards doubt, towards saying, I have known this all my life. I've known it so well. Um, what are the kind of challenges to this knowing? This is again Askari Nakvi. Um, he's singing Marcia. Um, the Conflictorium is in the old part of the city. Now, for you to very quickly know about Ahmedabad's geography, there's a river, the Sabarmati, that flows in the middle. That's the old city and the new city. Um, and the museum is in the old city. There's, there are two, uh, two times that the city is shut down, or the old city is shut down. One is during the Ratyatra, one is during Muharram. Um, because both these caravans go from, from the old city. Um, this is uh, Askari performing shows inside a building. Um, he's talking about lament. He's talking about mourning. Uh, if you ever do get a chance to listen to Askari, take it. Um, but Askari singing to an audience which I'm, I'm saying this with a lot of uh, restraint and being very careful, to a secular audience um, inside the museum, um, was happening for the first time uh, to an audience that's discovering that there are multiple narratives that we can talk about Muslim identity in, and it's not singular. Um, that day was a day when the audience was full of people from the new part of the city, mostly majority. In Ahmedabad, the segregation project is complete. A child in Ahmedabad can go from childhood to adolescence to adulthood without having to encounter any form of the other. Um, this segregation project then trickles down, starts from living spaces, but also trickles down to recreational spaces. Schools are different. Parks are different. Cinema halls are different. Right? Sounds unbelievable, right? But, but it's uh, true. But like all art spaces, all spaces of culture, the conflictorium also runs the risk of producing an effect of gentrification in its neighborhood. Now that would be, um, that would be a disaster if that's what happened. We are in a, uh, we're, the building is located in a, uh, in a poor locality. Um, how does the conflictorium make sense to its own neighborhood first, inside and outside? Um, it, we are now in our seventh year. It took very, very slow, slow steps, 
slow programming that first we were, we were moving out of the building and slowly everybody's moving into the building. Um, that's something we try and do often, this play between inside and outside. And, and if one really, I mean, I, I've been reflecting on really what is the conflictorium trying to do? Uh, and what are its strategies or what are the kind of mechanisms that one is using uh, to curate, to, um, to work in culture or to work in art practice? Um, and the one thing that that we are, we are happy or satisfied with for the moment, and it must change sooner than later, is um, how much we can work with empathy. Uh, now, I may sound really esoteric when I say empathy becomes a strategy. Um, but listening uh, is, is fairly absent. So sometimes the conflictorium has students, has uh, people from the neighborhood walking in and sitting at the museum, passing by curators, and then there are long conversations that were intended to be 15 minutes but end up being four hours. Uh, maybe the conflictorium is a practice of just generating space and time that's much slower to be able to process uh, where and how are we living. Um, so I often say that the conflictorium will have to stop becoming relevant at some point. So maybe when we are 10 years old, we'll have to shut down and start a chai shop at the conflictorium. Uh, maybe that is how we will respond to the times. Uh, and, um, and I don't want to sp say too much more about the conflictorium because I feel like let's keep some space possible for you guys to make a dash to Ahmedabad once and, and see the conflictorium. Um, that might be the best way of going forward. I'm going to end talking about my work here and take this conversation forward based on the kind of questions um, that you have for me. Is that fair? Yeah? Okay. Thank you. Hello, the floor is open for questions now. Ma'am, I, uh, it was first time I'm hearing that someone from Gujarat is telling that the process of other, othering, it has been so entrenched that children's school, children, children attend different school, different theaters, etc. I had never heard this before, but is it something that appeared only after the riots, 2002 riots, or has it been going on before that? And uh, how, uh, how, uh, how do you put the whole perspective of this, uh, uh, the how fascism has seeped into the Gujarati society, and do you relate it to a more, uh, uh, more historical context that goes beyond, uh, that goes before 2002, maybe some decades? Could you elaborate on it, on it a bit? So for Ahmedabad, I think every riot has been a project in acquiring more property. So the 69 riot pushed Muslim people from one area out to the outskirts to Juhapura. 2002, whatever little mixed areas were left, clear that out. So yes, it's, it's, it's a much beating. It's a project that started a long time ago, and it's not just just 2002 that did it. Um, in fact, the entire project has been, is so uh, well designed and when thought of, if you think about it like that. Um, we know that. We know that um, the RSS is a very, very systematic organization that's been working, at least in Gujarat, with design for at least 25 to 30 years. 
So uh, to imagine it as to to imagine 2002 as as an event that does something new, it does something specific to turn the pace of how it's done. But whether it does something new altogether, I'm not too sure of. Yeah. Oh, there's a mic, sorry. There's a question there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Um, I think uh, I think a lot of survival in Gujarat is about fighting fear and of being fearless every single day. So that's certainly something that we are all going to have to teach ourselves. Um, and the second is that. Um, The only way to go about this is mm, through, uh, through conversations on, less conversations on hate and more conversations on love. Because so much time and space is occupied by those who have a rhetoric on hate. That those who have one on love are still only countering but not offering an alternative narrative. Um, so I think these are two really, um, thank you, um, two key strategies of survival. Yeah, this. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you specifically about the conflict, the museum itself. So. Um, I, I want to know your opinion on to what extent do you see a concept like that sustaining itself or even expanding given the current scenario or where you know any form of radicalized art has you know, a very singular perspective of being looked at. Yeah. So what, what do you have to say about that? I would put nothing past our present regime. So. I would not spend too much time thinking of tomorrow uh, and doing what needs to be done today. Uh, if, if one had to think of expansion, which we do very often, either vertical expansion or horizontal expansion, maybe we, we dream of saying there will be one conflictorium in every city in India. We do, we, we do dream like that. Um, and sometimes we find the support and sometimes we don't. So we've been dreaming of making this happen for six, seven, eight years. We haven't been able to do it. Because it takes resources, it would mean that we would have to find uh, people who want to support something like this. And not that there aren't people support who want to support, but everybody is scared. So sh should we run our businesses, or should we give this money to what we actually believe in? Now it's become a, it's an either or. So yes, we are. Uh, we are dealing with that. Uh, but we have run so far. We have also done bake sales to run a museum. We have done those. And th those times have been there. Um, and, uh, and I think it's not only a museum like this. Any, any thought, and there are many in this country, any thought that's not buying into the majority predominant narrative is, is, is struggling to survive. Yeah. How? Don't ask me. Um, hi, my hi. name is Sanisha. I have visited the conflictorium. Okay. I've lived in Ahmedabad for two years. And um, so one way I was just trying to answer um, his question. I'm a Muslim from Surat who's lived in Ahmedabad. And when you talk about the uh, 2002 riots, uh, what you demonstrated through the slogans, the uh, Hindu the yeah. Kriyawala, uh, as subtle as this sounds, it was very violent when it was there. And we, we faced a lot of issues even in Surat. I remember my relatives uh, in, in that riot in Ahmedabad. And the areas that you mentioned, Juhapur and Shah Alam, I've taught there. So the situation where you um, 
where you compare the new city with the old city, with Juhapura, Shalam, or Kalupur, for that matter, uh, there's a lot of difference that you already see in how the areas are developing right yeah. now. Um, and I've seen the locality of this, this place. Now my question is, how do you deal with the conflicts that occur around the place yeah. um, with the community and with the political situation or the narrative that, that you're, what you're trying to do and how yeah. is it different from uh, yeah. what is already there? Um, so one is that it's, uh, I always think that there's, when there is an urgency, that's not the time to kind of rush into it. So when a fight is happening, and you go into then you go into that at that point of time, that's being really opportunistic. But what are you doing continuously? So the, in the neighborhood, we are now working with the children in the neighborhood, whether that's through bringing the kids into the building somehow, they're spending more and more time in the building. Um, we would do Sunday drawing jams, we would do theater sessions, and the kind of conversations that we are having there is incredible. There are eight-year-old girls who walk up to anybody at the conflictorium and say, Thursday, please empty out the auditorium, we have to do a play. Okay, ma'am, we will do this play on Thursday. What do you want to do this play about? Um, we have to, eight-year-old girl, we have to do a play about rape. And you're like, I'm not equipped to deal with this. Who can we bring in? I don't know why she knows this. I don't know how she knows this. I don't know this is what she's seen. I don't know whether it's with her. I don't know, right? So, um, and then we bring in the people who are equipped to facilitate this conversation and then put together a play and have eight-year-old girls, 10-year-old girls perform a piece on rape. Um, so the work in the neighborhood is ongoing. It's never, it's never based on event. Or the work with the women, it's still very difficult to work with the men in the neighborhood. It has been. We've tried, but it's been very difficult. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Ma'am, you said that after the video went viral, along with love, you uh, got a lot of hate because you are uh, telling the other side of the story too. So when you're doing that, what was like, what are the main, uh, you said, you can say obstacles or problems that you faced because uh, you were belonging from this side of the story, reinterpreting or telling what exactly wasn't told uh, about that side of the story. So. What was that struggle and what were the like, base, like major obstacles that you faced? I would like to know about that. Um, after I performed that piece? Yeah, and during this uh, uh, museum thing also, because you're okay. uh, showing other side of the story to your own people, like whom yeah. you consider your own people. Yeah. Um, let me start with the conflictorium first. I think the conflictorium doesn't take sides. So it does not have one side of the story. It has many circumstances through which you will have to examine your side of the story. Uh, you will have to examine whether, so everybody will have to examine. My side, your side, third side, fifth side, every side will have to examine how did we come to believe what we believe. Um, and that is a, uh, we've, uh, we, I have some incredible story. Actually, going back to your question also, we used to have uh, people from the IB come and sit in my office before I got to office, every once in a while, uh, saying, oh, you're going to invite this freedom poet from Tibet. He's reading poetry. Uh, why did you, how do you know him? This is Tenzing Sundu. I don't know if any of you have read his poetry. Uh, and we're like, no, no, he was just passing by. No, nothing doing. I know you sent that email out at 10.30 in the night. I'm like, right, okay, what can I do? I'm going to have to sit in this performance. Sure, it's a public performance. Please come in, sit. Officer sits, leaves, doesn't meet me after, meets nobody, leaves. By chance, also because he arrived earlier, sees the museum. 
the next thing i know every time he has a family member relative visitor from another city coming to ahmedabad to see him he brings him along and says we have to go and see the conflictorium so uh, sometimes we also underestimate how many transformations are happening slowly and steadily and they are happening Yeah. In that one, and also after your uh, video went viral, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just trying to think of whether I am in complete agreement with you on thinking of this story as having sides. Uh, I don't think. there is even that much space to have a side anymore um so so what we can possibly do is hopefully have house full of audiences that are mixed so a lot of our work goes into going out there and and marketing an event on many parts of the city in many kinds of neighborhood and then you'll have an audience that that actually is watching something or listening to something with someone who is an imagined other sitting next to them and how does that conversation break out those are the kind of opportunities that we are trying we we try and make happen um so sides i feel like that might be a limiting framework to even understand what's going on there to think that there are sides of the story hmm? yeah thanks um i'm so uh in your talk we talked about uh, first about musa and his uh, uh, conflicted love and then we talked about this perpetrated phenomenon of love jihad mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, society has been going from strength to strength in terms of segregated communities yeah. and living spaces but given the history of ahmedabad and gujarat in general i'm sure there would be a large community of people who would be quote and quote mixed religion marriages and relationships and even now with all the segregation i'm sure there would be uh, these uh, non exogamous marriages or relations which are effectively an affront to the existence of the society itself because these are living reminders that your way yeah. of uh, life or thought or the way you think of religion or race does not work so two questions here one is uh, how does this overtly uh, violent society deal with the people which who which exist yeah. and secondly are there any safe spaces for them to exist in the first place how how are they dealing with the society at large thank you achi to bring back the focus on to love um there are there are some examples in the city um and amdabad mirror will always on valentines day do like six stories of six mixed couple and they will be celebrated um but it's really really difficult and so if there is a mixed marriage the house will always be rented or bought in the name of the hindu person always uh, in those circumstances there no matter how what kind of like if this was a marriage that would have perpetrated patriarchy in a in a form of like changing names and all that it won't be because your name is currency at the moment so um housing is very difficult i know of couples who had pet names uh that uh say the car washer knew of the person who was muslim in the couple because it couldn't be known that this is a muslim person so it's very very difficult but uh, you are right they are truly 
people in love are truly subverting every single attempt at at whatever's going on um and then every once in a while you hear of a suicide the sabarmati river is notorious like that people go on to a bridge and jump and people jump for love um people jump for same sex love people jump for interreligious love intercaste love I mean i'm talking about interreligion here but the intercaste love marriages we have seen in national media uh what intercaste marriage does so love is uh, the single most powerful weapon that i think this regime does know how to deal with they just do not know what to do with love so it's a good strategy you guys yeah thanks does anyone else have a question hi hi so love and hate they both are extremely powerful emotions uh as far as i understand violence and rights to some extent it's the mobilization of a deeply seated anger inside people um otherwise you cannot mobilize unite people against one single idea uh so to some ex- to so for some years we saw uh, a period of peace and harmony was that all superficial what really i mean if love is equally a strong emotion something with which people really relate to how come they could be easily mobilized against love people in gujarat are mobilized on one bottle of local alcohol that's all it takes so this understanding that a riot is possible when people are sort of holding anger um and then going out there we there is a relationship with how the political class understands poverty and then mobilizes it so this kind of imagination that there must be anger and this we have heard in now popular legend soon becoming mythology that um, the chief minister during 2002 said people are angry give them a free hand this is part of the legend of 2002 so to buy into that narrative that there is this kind of anger yes there is um, there is conflict there's no denying that there always has been so i'm not saying oh everything is peaceful always has been no it's a civilizational clash it's been there oh, whatever happened to morality no so there has been differences there are ways of dealing with differences um even if there were people who sort of there was one community who ate meat in cut in this way one community who ate meat cut in this way they still lived with each other and it was uh, not considered kosher to be able to say hateful things in public that discourse has changed what we are allowed to say in public has changed which we were not allowed to so there was still some some sense of a morality that we were deriving from some other framework maybe and i'm not too sure maybe it was a constitutional morality so what really led it to that that uh, set of extremities really when you have a state that is sanctioning when the state sanctions violence in any case the state assumes that it has a monopoly on violence right when the state sanctions it if the head of state uses the kind of language that we have heard the head of state using what kind of messaging are you giving down there how does that message trickle down and what kind of behavior what kind of citizenship do you generate 
let's not forget we are also a really really young country and discourse building is an important part of building the country as much as policy as much as um, getting things to happen discourse is as important so that certainly changed in the last couple of years uh can you talk more about uh, your experience of dancing in front of lao jihad graffitis like uh, you mentioned there were five spaces you picked up one was a college wall like what were the other spaces and on what basis you like shortlisted those five spaces to perform and uh, were you able to spark the intended conversations right after that okay and uh, second question is can we frame it as an attempt to take art to the people second question first i think this thing of taking art to the people i want to piggy back ride on what someone else said that um if art is not available for the poor it's neither radical nor revolutionary right so if art is going to have to be need, if it needs to be taken out to the people through a specific act then oh my god something's going really terribly wrong with art practice in the country um so i don't want to imagine it as this special thing i'm the converse is something i probably want to hang on to that our art practice in other spaces need to be opened up and democratized a lot more the accessibility needs to go up a lot more so i am agreeing in some senses with you but with a slightly different frame uh what happened during the lab jihad the uh, uh performance yes there was lots of conversation uh, mostly conversation around making what is invisible visible so this was a 3 minute performance the song is about 5 minutes um but we cut it down to 3 minutes the first minute uh people took the first minute to just sort of understand oh my god there's something happening in public space let's try and figure out what's happening the second minute and sort of saying that there is a body that's dancing that that was the first minute and saying okay some beautiful clothes moving movement all that second minute was about weight this body this dancing body is going back and forth in front of a graffiti and coming back oh wait the graffiti says something so the second minute was taken to visibilize the graffiti that they had been passing by every single day but hadn't noticed and the third minute was used to assimilate the okay dancing body graffiti oh there's a relationship something's going on there and i think i understand or don't agree or disagree or agree or whatever by the third minute when you've done all of this in your head the performance is over and so you have to deal with the anxiety of agreement or disagreement on your own or within your friends or you'll have to go back home and tell someone at home that oh i saw this on the street today um the couple of times that i stayed back on me promise um was um, when people disagreed and did say why are you doing this do you not think that there is a danger so then the narrative that they know best they want to share with you and get your response on but the advantage of of dance or art practice in that sense is that it's not passing through a cognitive process it's a much more um sensory trigger so it's on your body you can't tell exactly what what is happening but i'm moved i can't kind of make like sense of it there's no reason but i'm moved that's the advantage of of art Yeah.
How do you mean projects outwards? Can you say that differently? I, I was just wondering if conflicts between people happen maybe because there's conflict in the self. I don't um, I think conflict happens when you're too sure, when you're too damn sure of what you believe in. If there was doubt, you're still open for someone else to have a different point of view because you are also in doubt. When your beliefs are so fixed, I think that that's perfect ground for conflict to, to happen. Whether there, is a, whether there is a conflict between the self, of course there is. There always is. I mean, conflict is a sign that you're truly alive. So at no point is the conflictorium or uh, all this work trying to say there should be no conflict, all conflict should be resolved. No, that's not the point at all. Conflict doesn't have to become violence. It can be transformed before it reaches that stage. Yeah. It's a really tough question to answer, and I, I have a different answer every time, and it's very long. So I'm not too sure whether I want to uh, start that right now. But I think it was a sum total of a set of experiences. Um, it was certainly motivated by being witness and not being able to live with oneself as witness. Um, yeah, maybe that's a conversation we can have outside. Yes. Hi. Uh, you had mentioned that you stopped dancing for quite some time, and you said um, there's just so much you could dance about Krishna. Uh, one of the things, I don't know if everybody else agrees, is classical music and classical dance is enjoyed and think by a particular class of people. Yeah. See, you've taken a particular form of dance and you've used it in a different cultural setting and to show conflict of a different kind of people. Uh, do you think it's possible to break this classical idea? I, the minute you say classical, yes. it has class in it. It also has caste in it. Caste in it. Uh, how many other performers would you know, or how much action is being done to, I, I don't want to use the frame, take that to the, the, yeah. the people, but to, for people to understand that I, I can also access that. Yeah. Uh, so art itself in that form needs to break out of yeah. that position there. What's being done about that? Wait, I mean, if you know. For a very long time, if you had to be recognized as a dancer, you would either need the Sabhas or the ICCR, the Indian Cultural Council relationship, or uh, the classical dance conferences. You would need all these kinds of spaces to legitimize your identity as a dancer. The good thing about being in this time right now is that you don't need this certificate from them. I can believe I am a dancer, I can be trained the, as a dancer, and I can generate several platforms, whether it be through a YouTube video, sitting at home on a mobile phone, or it somehow being, if I have the privilege, to access a stage or a public space. So um, that certainly shifted. And I think the internet has a big role to play. Having said that, uh, the form changes the moment it's on video. If one sees the performance as an embodied form, I, I, don't, I don't know whether as much as should have been happening is happening. But I wouldn't say nothing is happening. I think there are lots of artists who, who are pushing those boundaries, who are who are saying that the, the music and the dance must come out of the sabha, um, will have to find alternative audiences. I think that conversation has begun. Uh, maybe it's not gotten too far. I think because there's also a very big possibility that the, the people who do enjoy that or who, uh, who patronize that, uh, if I can use that word, sure tries to hold that back for themselves. Yeah, sure. Because uh, even before the internet, I think it was a Telugu film called Shankara Varanam, which actually used uh, classical music, and it became a hit among everybody, including people who they thought right. won't appreciate that thing. But it's still being held back from being, uh, yeah. let's just do it uh, for, for a cultural event outside for this or for that. That still doesn't happen, though. Five minutes.
and it's more or, yeah it's okay okay yeah um i wanted to ask if uh, since we were talking about uh, how hate is collectivized and yeah. um it might be generated it might not be original hate in the minds of people it might be generated by different people is there a need to collectivize uh, love specifically romantic love and uh, my second question was why did you not choose a duet performance uh, in front of the uh, for the love jihad performances um, the answer that came to my mind was probably you didn't want a binary gender uh, hmm. to uh, but then do you think it would have been it would have been more impactful if it was a do it these are the two questions i have well i think uh, i felt legitimized in doing this alone because the the graffiti was specifically talking to hindu daughters so it felt like for once i have the credibility to speak otherwise i shouldn't be i should be shutting up and leaving the stage for those who must be actually or are speaking um so that's that on the do it bit what about collective love we i don't know whether the the same strategies that hate chooses should be replaced by love that's not that's not even the point love has its own ways it has its own methods and its tools um uh, intimacy is a tool of love not tool but an expression of love and i think intimacy is doing something that now to replace that with a collectivization we something might get lost in the process but if you think about it then what is what is protest if not collective love i know you're heading towards collective romantic love but what is manorama's mothers being out there protesting against the indian army bearing them their bodies completely if that's not collective love then i don't really know what is it takes a lot of passion to be able to put your body out there as as the primary uh primary method of dissent or resistance okay i hope that's all no actually i don't hope that's all i hope there's lots more uh thank you abhi ma'am for coming to our fest and uh, doing the last uh, event of the day as guest speaker and i'm hope i'm i'm thank you audience for coming here turning up in huge numbers and uh engaging with her and she's around here for a while so in case anyone wants to talk to her she can uh, you guys can go ahead and do that and thank you all